Hello and welcome back to Introduction to General Relativity. In the previous lecture, we left off discussing and introducing static spherically symmetric solutions to Einstein's field equations. This topic naturally leads us to the second and also one of the most celebrated solution of Einstein's field equations, namely the Schwarzschild solution. So if you recall in the previous lecture, we argued that the metric of a static spherically symmetric rotationally invariant all right, that's what spherically symmetric means. Uh, such a metric uh, takes the following form. Or one can choose a coordinate system where the metric takes the following form. So this was the content of the previous lecture. And this is the uh, solution that we will, that we so found. Now this isn't quite a solution to Einstein's field equations, rather this is just the application of the symmetries that we demand of the solution on the form of the metric. So we've just written down a metric, the most general one that's static and spherically symmetric, and this is not yet a solution to Einstein's field equations. We have to deal with two, two uh, unknowns here that we'll have to, to solve for. So we've got a function fr and a function hr. And our uh, task today is to solve for these two functions. They're simple functions of a single variable, namely the radial component r. And in order to solve for these, we need to, to substitute the, the metric into Einstein's field equations, um, work out the Christoffel symbols, work out the Ricci tensor, and so on, and then also equate it to the stress energy tensor. And today we're gonna to be looking only at the vacuum case. So that's where the stress energy tensor is zero. So we're gonna eventually equate the Ricci tensor to zero. And then we're gonna find conditions that uh, F and H have to satisfy in order to be a solution or furnish a solution to Einstein's field equation in the absence of any stress energy. So let's start it's a purely uh, mechanical procedure now. We just take the metric and we start computing. And that's gonna be the goal for the next two lectures. So we start by summarizing the components of the metric. So we've got the, the, the metric written in this differential form up above, but it's also convenient just to write out the components of the metric in component form. So we only have four non-zero components. We have the time-time component, which is minus fr. We have the radial-radial component, which is hr. We have the theta-theta component, which is r squared. And we have the phi-phi component, which is r squared sine squared theta. Now that we have the metric and it's diagonal, right? that's kind of really nice that if you were to put this in matrix form, you would see that this is a diagonal four by four matrix. Then we can easily invert the, the metric to find its components, the inverse matrix components. And we easily find that the inverse metric has the following components here. It's also a diagonal matrix, of course. So now we've got the components of the metric, both the metric and its inverse, we can go ahead and compute the Christoffel symbols. It's the next part of our task to get at the Ricci tensor for this metric. So this is, well, a little bit of an exercise. It's not the world's most complicated uh, computation, but you know, there's a little bit of hard work involved here in working out the Christopher symbols. You have to do some partial derivatives and work out which components are non-trivial. But essentially it's a mechanical computation that you can put into your favorite algebra program if you don't care to do the computation. Uh, there are more elegant ways to compute the Ricci tensor. Uh, it must be said, we could use the tetrad formalism, which I didn't cover in this course. 
Um, that's probably better, best left for a more advanced course. So in the tetrad formalism, there is another way to get at the Ricci tensor. Uh, I won't be uh, doing that. I'll just show you the most direct way um, because this minimizes the amount of magic involved in, in the, the computation. You see that it's purely a mechanical procedure. So it's now an exercise to show that all the Christoffel symbols, the only non-zero Christoffel symbols are the following ones. So we've got a long list. So it's more really a bookkeeping problem. I don't think any single Christoffel symbol is difficult to compute. Certainly you could leave this as a homework in a first year calculus course. But the main task is more the, the, the bookkeeping, keeping track of all these symbols so you don't, you don't mislabel one or forget one that's zero when it should be non-zero or whatever. So as always, there's a some probability that I make a transcription error. So it's not only an exercise for the good of your soul to work out these Christoffel symbols. It's also a great form of error correction to ensure that I haven't made a mistake in writing down these Christoffel symbols. So I highly encourage you to work out at least one or two, maybe take a random sample and uh, convince yourself that either I've written the right Christoffel symbols down or the wrong ones. And then tell me in the comments. Okay, hopefully, though, I've written down the correct ones, and then, and then uh, we have all the information we now need to start computing the Ricci tensor. So, you know, I've, ex I, I've uh, implied that there are more sophisticated ways to write down the Ricci tensor. Well, we're going to take the least sophisticated route uh, in order to not obscure the physics here, and the least the least sophisticated route to computing the Ricci tensor is just to go to the component formalism for the Riemann tensor and then contract. And in particular, if you look at the, the lecture that I gave at the end of the discussion of differential geometry, you'll be able to find this formula here. which is just a contracted form of the Riemann tensor. So we have at our disposal now all the Christoffel symbols. Now we just have to go through the tedious task of carrying out these contractions and multiplications. And that's another exercise. You should, uh, should find actually that the answer is pretty simple. So maybe the easiest way to, to start this exercise is to first convince yourself that the Riemann tensor is zero as long as mu is not equal to nu. Okay, so that only leaves you with four, four things to actually compute. And then you can look at the four components of the Ricci tensor then in turn. And these are, you know, not uncon not uncomplicated, but again, this is Calculus, straightforward calculus, there's no sophisticated anything's going on here.
And we come to the fourth and final component, non-trivial component of the Ricci tensor, which is the time-time component, which I wrote down last. So they're starting to look, well, you know, a bit intricate, lots of Fs and Rs and their derivatives. But actually, the remarkable thing about the Schwarzschild solution is how easy the actual uh, equations are to solve in the end. So there we go, we've summarized the non-trivial components of the Riemann, uh, of the Ricci tensor. And that's what we need now to apply Einstein's equations. And that's what we're going to do next, right? So what we're going to, what we're trying to do here at this stage is model the gravitational field outside of some spherical source. Uh, we'll get to the inside part in the next lecture. So outside of a spherically symmetric uh, distribution of stress energy, the gravitational field should be spherically symmetric, right? And outside this source, the stress energy tensor is zero. So that's what we're going to do first. So you've got to imagine, you know, we have some celestial body, a star. Indeed, that's pretty much all we're going to focus on in this course is a star. So here it is there, a big hot liquid gas thing. And uh, the gravitation, you know, the star deforms the gravitational field. Thanks to Einstein's field equation. This is my cartoon for the gravitational field, these blue lines here. And we, we assume that there's no part of the star outside of the, the, the body of the star, right? There's no, no atoms or any stress, form of stress energy outside of the star. And we're, we're at the currently, we're solving for the gravitational field, which is just the metric. What we're gonna do in the next uh, lecture is to solve the gravitational field outside the celestial body and the the gravitational field inside the interior solution we'll do uh, in the next lecture so in order to solve for the uh, gravitational field outside a star, we need the vacuum Einstein's field equations. And then we're going to find in the next lecture the interior solution with the, the, the usual non-vacuum Einstein field equations. And then we're going to paste the two solutions together. Now, we won't quite use just the vacuum Einstein's field equations. We're actually going to use the trace-free form or trace, sorry, not trace-free, the trace-reversed form. So recall from uh, lecture 13, the uh, what you could call trace-reversed form. of Einstein's field equations, which read r mu nu equals eight pi. And we've gotten rid of the metric from Einstein's tensor. And then we replace that contribution with a contribution coming from the trace of the stress energy tensor. So this is a completely equivalent form of Einstein's field equations. Um, and that we, the reason we like this form is that in a vacuum, Uh, t mu nu equals zero, and therefore, of course, so does t. So uh, actually, uh, the Einstein's field equations in a vacuum are super simple, right? It just says that the Ricci tensor, they just say the Ricci tensor is, is zero. And since we've already got four components of the Ricci tensor, we just have to equate these four components to zero. And so uh, that makes our life super easy, right? It just suffices to set just three equations to zero. Y3 
3, well, if you look back up at the Ricci tensor here, the, 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 the phi phi component is just proportional to the theta theta component. So, you know, you get it for free. Um, and, well, you could just go through and do that. Um, so let's, you know, you take the Ricci tensor, you take these components, then you set them to zero, and then you, you set about the task of solving this coupled set of nonlinear differential equations. And the first thing you might do is start to eliminate, you know, Fs and Hs. And uh, I'll save you the bother and just point out that you can, you can do that uh, by, you can eliminate the, uh, you don't quite eliminate the Fs and the Hs, but you can place, you can exploit the, the three equations that are now Einstein's field equations to derive a, a very simple form or just to derive a, a very simple e equation that needs to be satisfied. Uh, and it, it, this particular equation relates f, the derivative of f and the derivative of h. Uh, right, this equation is going to be zero. And so if you add these two particular combinations of RTT and RR, uh, then you see that you get this equation on the right. And of course, the, the R over a, the one over R times H R component cancels out. And you're left with an incredibly simple equation, right? You're left with F prime over F plus H prime over H is zero. Well, another way of writing that is that uh, F is just equal to a constant times by H to the minus one. So that's pretty cool, you know, uh, we've already completely eliminated uh, H from the story. And this constant, well, we can rescale time to get rid of that constant. So if we take T goes to root KT, uh, we may just simply set k equal to one. Now, uh, well, we may as well use the information we have at hand. Namely, r theta theta is uh, in r theta theta. To get the following consequence, if we go back to r theta theta. So if you look at r theta theta here and you use the fact that, well, you know, f is minus one over h, sorry, f is one over h, then uh, then things simplify pretty, pretty dramatically. And we're left with um, this rather simple equation, namely minus f prime plus one minus f over r is zero. And that you can totally, you can rearrange to get a total derivative. And uh, well, that you can integrate to get that f is one plus some constant over r. And what we've just done is we've actually just solved for the metric. Now we'll just substitute in what we've obtained for f and h. And then we'll see we've reduced everything down to one undetermined constant, which we will determine in the course of the next minutes. So we've used an abbreviation here. And uh, this particular solution, this is what we call the Schwarzschild metric. And it was 
obtained in 1916 by Schwarzschild. So we have this constant C inside the, the Schwarzschild metric and you know what should that constant be? You know, there's, since we're talking about a celestial body uh, as a source for this uh, gravitational field, um, there's not many constants that you might attach to a celestial body. And so the first guess, and the correct guess, right, is that C is somehow proportional to the mass. Um, and, and that will interpret in a second. Or that will argue in a second. And, uh, but before we do that, I just want to point out that, you know, this went rather painlessly, this uh, solution of Einstein's field equation. And it, unfortunately, this is not the nature of things. Uh, it's not easy to solve Einstein's field equations. On the, on the contrary, it's an extraordinarily intricate and uh, involved task to actually solve Einstein's field equations in general. We've just selected in this course out the very best two solutions that really uh, uh, Illustrate the illustrate some extraordinary amounts of physics with an extraordinary little amount of, of work by exploiting certain symmetries, in particular spherical symmetry in this case here. So the the Schwarzschild solution should be you know you should think of this as kind of like the hydrogen atom uh, of general relativity or the hydrogen atom is the Schwarzschild solution of quantum mechanics if you like. Um, they they both pertain to spherically symmetry. Um, entities and they are both are extremely important in cosmology. Now we want to interpret this constant C, right? So how, how are we going to do that? Well, you know, one is just by saying what else could it be? That's one way to interpret it. Well, that's not quite as satisfying. Uh, you, you maybe got to work a little harder. And one way to, to do this is to just argue about what happens as R tends to infinity. Well, in the limit r tends to infinity, right? Just set r is infinity in this metric here. I know it's not well defined, but take a look at the first two terms. You'll see that, that they basically basically tend down. The first two terms in the solution tend to minus dt squared plus dr squared. And so, in that case, you can say that the metric is a, is approaching. I mean, to make this rigorous, you do need to work a little harder. But uh, this is already sufficient, actually, for um, identifying the constant. So in the limit that r tends to infinity, this, uh, this metric actually approaches the Minkowski metric. Uh, and you should think of these c over r terms as like a perturbation. And there is a place where you can uh, understand perturbations in general relativity, right? We covered that. Um, when we looked at linearized general relativity or general relativity in perturbation theory. And we derived a pretty general formula for the metric in perturbation theory in the Newtonian limit. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare the motion of a test body in the Newtonian limit with the motion of a test body in the Schwarzschild solution here. And then, uh, then we'll be able to interpret that constant directly. So we're all doing this in the weak field limit, right? So this is an excellent exercise for you. Uh, all right, this should test your knowledge of the Newtonian theory of the Schwarzschild solution. This is equation star, by the way. And what you should conclude after your exercise is that the constant should be, to be consistent with the Newtonian weak field limit, the constant should be minus 2m, where m is the mass of this celestial body.
and setting c is this constant gives us the final form of the solution. And that's it. That's pretty pretty awesome. An amazing accomplishment. Uh, this this metric does indeed differ from the Newtonian theory, especially for large M. And we're going to investigate in the, the next lecture and in the following lectures the motion of test bodies in the presence of this metric. And uh, we'll see that this leads to some of the most celebrated uh, predictions and verif now verified experimentally of general relativity. So uh, before we, we finish the discussion of the Schwarzschild metric, the external vacuum solution, uh, I want to point out that there are some peculiarities about this solution. There are two singularities. Uh, in the solution, right? You, you should be able to spot where they are, right? What happens when R is zero? Well, that doesn't look so good, does it? Um, you've got like infinite minus infinity times dt squared and minus infinity times d, uh, and sorry, um, just just one singularity on the, the time component. And, uh, and so that doesn't look good. Um, and there's also a second one, right? What happens if R is 2m? It'll also make things go infinite. So we have to think about these singularities and try and interpret them. Are they real singularities? Or are they just simply the results of a bad coordinate patch? Right? You know, it could be you know, space time is a manifold, we've chosen the coordinate patch for our manifold. Perhaps our chart just simply breaks down at one of these points. And actually the, the manifold itself is the full solution is nice and smooth and there are no problems. Well, that actually is the case in, in for the singularity uh, at r equals 2m. That is a coordinate singularity. I mean, it's a little bit complicated to argue that. It's a little bit uh, uh, complicated to organize, uh, to, a little bit complicated to argue that. So we won't actually argue this here. Uh, because in, in a way it turns out to be not relevant. We will actually paste on this coordinate patch with, with the interior solution. And the reason why is this. It, it's the following. So for usual objects, right, you know, um, e.g. not black holes, this radius r equals 2m, where is it? You might wonder where is this, this, uh, this singularity? Well, if you reintroduce big G, uh, the, 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 this point r equals 2m usually lies very deep within the object itself. So for example, for the sun, uh, rs, this, this breakdown point, Uh, where does that lie? Well, it lies at about 2.95 kilometers, which is, well, you know, right in the center of the sun. But that's exactly where the vacuum Einstein field equations aren't meant to apply. Right?
The same holds for the singularity, obviously, at r is zero. The only place uh, where we have to take really care about these singularities is, of course, for uh, more exotic objects in our universe, namely black holes. In that case, one has to take more care about uh, the Schwarzschild solution. Uh, but that is not, unfortunately, a topic for this course. It's an advanced topic, a highly interesting topic, which we will, I will uh, postpone to the advanced course on general relativity. Um, and instead, we'll move on in the next lecture to discussing interior solutions. So what the, what does the solution to Einstein's field equation look like for a static spherically symmetric body? Um, with spherical symmetric distribution of stress and energy. And we'll derive that in the next lecture. And then we'll commence the discussions, the discussion of the motion of test bodies in the presence of the Schwarzschild solution. But that's a topic uh, for next week. For now, that's it. Until next time, goodbye.